Hey everybody, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. Oftentimes when we talk about the economy or we talk about politics even, it's very, very focused on the quantitative aspect, the dollar signs, all of those things that can feel dehumanizing. So I'm excited to announce that I am launching a <laughs> launching a podcast, which sounds, you know, it's like, oh gosh. But this podcast is in co-production with public.com and the main goal is to analyze these systems the economy, the political system, with the end goal to humanize them, to give you the tools to make better decisions about the capitalist systems that we're all a part of. So that is the main idea behind the podcast and will be the main focus of these conversations is how do we recenter people into the systems that are people driven. The first guest today is Derek Thompson and I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Sliceonomics, a podcast that slices through the complexities of economics to reveal the human side behind the numbers. I'm your host, Kyla Scanlon, and I'm here to make economics relatable and guide you through the financial stories and cultural trends that shape the way that we view the economy. Sliceonomics is a co-production with public.com, an investing platform that allows people to invest in stocks, ETFs, treasuries, crypto, art, collectibles, and more all in one place. Scan the QR code right here on the screen or check out the link in the episode description box to learn more. Today, we're speaking with Derek Thompson, staff writer at The Atlantic. Hey, Derek. It's so great to have you here. Hey, it's a real honor. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. So I first want to, you know, you've written and done so many things. Uh, we were just talking before the podcast started. Um, I was in your like tweets and you seem to have noticed based on the questions that I had crafted for this. But I want to talk about your book on abundance that you're writing with Ezra Klein. And we're in this time of relative stagnation. You know, a general feeling of melancholy seems to be abound. So how do you think that we rally people around this idea of progress and plenty that you are talking about in this book? Well, I like the way that you framed the question because sometimes people ask me, how do we build, say, an abundance agenda? How do we build a set of policies and laws and regulations that could allow us to have an abundance of you know, health and housing and clean energy, for example? But you asked a different question, which is how do we rally people around this cause? And I do think that this project of building an abundance agenda or an abundance movement requires both. It's not enough to have really good policies for making it easier to build apartment buildings or making it easier to invest in solar and geothermal and even modular nuclear power plants to provide abundant clean energy for Americans. You also need to get people on board this project. And one thing that we've been thinking a lot about, and I'll, I'll speak personally for myself, one thing I think a lot about is the inconsistencies that people live with when they embrace a scarcity mindset. So, for example, I was having a conversation with uh, an older friend. Um, I'm friends with uh, him and I'm friends with his children um, in uh, Los Angeles. And he was complaining about construction in a rich neighborhood in Los Angeles. And he said, oh, it's just so awful. They're trying to put up this apartment building. It's just it's so messy and it's loud. And I don't want all like all the traffic and the extra parking. And then we start talking about his kids. And he says, it's so hard. There's nowhere for them to buy in Los Angeles. There's no houses for them to buy in Los Angeles. And I was like, <laughs> if you now could remember what you 30 seconds ago was saying, you would see the connection between these ideas. We want the outcome of housing abundance without the process of mm -hmm. housing construction. And so one thing that I think is really important is to get people to think intergenerationally, get people to think temporally, not just about the... That's about what we have now, but what we need in the next few years in order for us to have well-being and for our children to have it as well. Mm -hmm. And there's this uh, article by John Byrne Murdoch, I think is how you say his last name, uh, where he's talking about zero-sum thinking and how it's more common in millennials and, you know, with this person that you were talking to, where people can only get rich at the expense of others. Like, how do you... How do you sort of make, make people think beyond just themselves, like this idea of American individualism? Well, I think that the decline of trust is clearly one of the major cultural themes of the last 20, 30, 50 years. Uh, and it's not just declining trust in millennials, although I do think that millennials are a leading edge of this movement. It's declining trust of, among all Americans in a variety of institutions. There's declining trust in the media. There's declining trust in big companies. There's declining trust in banks, declining trust in Congress, in the Supreme Court, in the military. Uh, we're definitely living through a period of plummeting trust. 
And I do think that's a huge part of the gloom that people have about yeah. America and about the world. They don't feel like they can trust any particular institution to do its job. There are lots of questions to ask if we had you know, hours and hours to talk about it, of whether or not institutions have really always been bad. And the tools of sort of digital transparency that we have now make it easier to see the flaws that institutions have always had. That's possible. It's also possible that for a variety of, institu- for, for a variety of reasons, institutions are doing a worse job than they used to. Um, but you know, there's, there's no way to get around this problem besides just building better institutions. And a huge problem facing us is how do we build better institutions that um, build infrastructure more effectively, build housing more effectively, build clean energy more effectively so that people can see the fruits of abundance and thereby trust that government can give it. Yeah. I was talking to Deb Chakra earlier this morning um, about her book. It's about infrastructure and like how it's all collective. Like we all share the same water. We all share the same electricity. Um, And do you think in her eyes, like it's like if we just get people to buy into this collective ideology, like then we'll be able to progress forward and like have infinite energy um, because we can tap into the sun and things like that. Like for you, how do you balance a take like that, which is probably pretty optimistic, right? That we can have everybody rally behind each other. Um, and then the maybe the world that we live in now that feels much less optimistic. Uh, interestingly, your question made me think of a quote by Jeff Bezos, which says that uh, when my data disagrees with the anecdotes that I see, I tend to believe the anecdotes. And I think about this a lot when people, for example, complain about, you know, and I've complained about this, the fact that people are gloomy about an economy that in many ways is a good economy. The unemployment rate is really low, labor participation is rising, real wages are growing over the last few quarters. And I always want to sort of like pause that sort of data side of my brain and think, if people are glum, if they're despondent, they're despondent for, for actual justifiable reasons, and we should be curious about the reasons. So in some cases, like why people might be gone about the economy, it's as simple as, well, you know, inflation is relatively high over the last two years. So that's eroding the feeling of real wages. For a question like, why are people pessimistic about public goods? I do think that like the record of public institutions over the last 20, 30 years has been really bad, whether it's accounting with Enron or, you know, public health with the pandemic or the banks with um, uh, the global financial crisis. And so, you know, I, 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 even as I am like a relatively optimistic, like progressive uh, and abundance progressive, I have a lot of time for the fact that people's lack of trust in the system is downstream of the system's failures. And so I want to understand the system's failures and I want to try to fix them because I don't believe that a world without institutions is workable. I think we need them. Yeah. We just need them to work better. Yeah. And I feel like, too, this is something that comes up a lot and has come up, I think, increasingly is media negativity. So like media headlines trend more negative. Um, a lot of it is about clickability and, and do, driving ad sales. Um, and I'm curious, like what you think the role of journalism is in sort of, you know, supporting these institutions and then also managing that side of like the business side, like the economic side of journalism. Yeah, journalism is a business and journalism is also much more than a business. Right? There's a civic obligation to tell the truth with the understanding that if you tell the truth and no one reads it, then what good have you done for the world? And so I think about that tension all the time. The fact that I'm producing something that is a kind of entertainment in that it succeeds and fails by the metrics of any entertainment, right? With streams and clicks and listens. And yet it is something more than I think a movie. It's a representation of what matters in the world. I believe that negativity bias among audiences is one of the most fundamental things for any journalist or publisher to understand, right? When it bleeds, it leads is a cliche for a reason. Nonetheless, if you only focus your coverage on negativity, I do think that there are biases that can slip into your view of the world, your view of reality. So one thing that I try to do a lot is I try to look for problems where I think I can point out interesting solutions. And that allows me to sort of have the cake and eat it too. I can leave with negativity, here's a problem in the world, and use it as a kind of Trojan horse for solutionism. Here are some ways that maybe we can understand this issue or even fix it. Um, Or here's a call to the importance of this issue so other people can have, can bring their intelligence to the topic. That's sort of like negativity Trojan horse is some, is a way that I think about, I think I've sometimes called it like, um, Trojan horse catastrophism um, is the way that I think about coverage a lot. Yeah, you come up with so many uh, phrases. <laughs> like you have so many words. How do you how do you do that? Like, is it just in There's your so head? So many or... words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was uh, talking with um, 
another writer friend about this. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I think. Um, <laughs> I think it's possible that it's possible that I'm like a really simple person, um, and that I need very like simple words and simple images to understand the world. And other people might be able to deal with a little bit more untethered complexity in their understanding of the complexities of life. Um, I need the straitjacket of a simple metaphor or simple binary, not this, but that, to like understand something that's complicated. Um, and if I don't find that in my reporting, when I'm trying to understand an issue or making a podcast, if I don't find that simple binary or that simple frame, I feel like I haven't done my job. And my job is to provide a frame that's memorable, not only for the audience, but also to myself. Because, um, you know, like you, to a certain extent, I'm writing about all these different ideas. Like I'm writing about, you know, COVID policy and then I'm writing about macroeconomics and I'm writing about, I don't know, something in sociology as MPEC. I don't want to be the kind of dilettantish news parachuter who dives into one topic, learns about it really quickly, forgets everything that I've learned and then goes on to something else. I want to like find a frame I can like carry with me as I go forward. And the best way to do that, I think, is to be really rigorous about like, wait, do I have a frame do I have a name for this idea that I can remember? Um, and then audiences, I think, sometimes either appreciate it because they can remember it or um, just as well. They're like, um, that's uh, unbelievably you know, gauche of you, Derek, to be constantly like naming things and coming up with terms and they're very annoyed by it. But like, I, um, it's, not, it's not an error that I'm putting on it. It is, it is how, I need, how I need to think in order to remember what I'm covering. Yeah, I'm definitely like that too. I mean, I have all these drawings in my newsletter, but you know, you're talking about this idea of binaries and in a world of such complex nuance and all these details, like how do you sort of parse, like what's your process for parsing things into those two buckets? Well, I think it was, was it Wittgenstein who said that anything that can be thought, can be said, and anything that can be said, can be said simply. Yeah. Something along those lines. Yeah. Um, that might not be uh, verbatim, but I think that's the, uh, that's the Wittgensteinian gist. I do think that he was right on that point. I know very little of that, about that particular philosopher, but um, there's, uh, there's a real beauty in the idea that anything that can be thought can be said, and anything that can be said can be said simply. And it means two things. Um, if you, oh, actually, you can go one step further. It can be said simply and entertainingly. Um, so if, you, if your job is to understand and explain an idea and you can't understand and explain it simply, then you haven't done your job. And if you can't communicate it in a way that is not only simple, but also somewhat memorable or entertaining as I'm putting it, you still haven't done your job. So, you know, simple is hard. Coming up with a simple frame, a true and simple frame, for an idea is really, really hard, but like, that's the damn job. So, um, that's just like the standard to which I try to hold myself. Yeah. Yeah. And on, on Dave Burrell's <clears throat> podcast, you were talking about baseball and like how baseball has become more boring. And so we were just talking about like nuance and complexity. And at the same time, like we have sort of the standardization of things because of algorithms, because of data points. Um, and how do you think of that standardization? And are the incentives sort of misaligned there for this idea of progress that we we're talking about at, at the beginning? So kind of looping way back to the beginning, like standardization and the idea of progress. Like how do those two tie together? Sure. Yeah. You're referring to one of my favorite articles from last year, which was called The Dark Side of Moneyball. And The Dark Side of Moneyball started with this idea that baseball has gotten a lot more boring as the sport has ironically gotten smarter. Mm -hmm. And that you see this dynamic playing out in a couple of different industries. As the industry gets quantitatively smarter, it gets qualitatively more boring. I think it's true of baseball. I think it might be true of basketball. I think it might be true of Hollywood. I think it might be true of music. And there's pieces of evidence that suggest that I might be right across all of those various industries. But fundamentally, I'm interested in this idea that as we get smarter about what people want, um, there's a tendency to only give them what they just consumed. Because if you ask someone, you know, um, uh, like what kind of music they like, they're going to tell you music that they're very familiar with, that they've already heard. And so you're only going to make music or serve music to that person that's extremely similar to what you've already served them, which means that there's no possibility for novelty. I think that the, it's conceivable that this very dynamic, this sort of like um, sort of hyperlooping on familiarity might be happening, you mentioned progress, in science as well. 
Um, there's some evidence, for example, by uh, the University of Chicago professor James Evans that suggests that there's simply so many papers in science to read that no one has time to read them all. So as a result, they just all focus on the same small number of papers and all write about the same number of things. To a certain extent, you're a, pr a participant um, of Twitterland or Xland, whatever it's called. This happens in this happens online as well, um, where people concentrate around a set of terms or ideas or frames, not because they are the best ones, but because that's where people are already clustering. Um, and so I think that it's it's really important. Um, you know, we're spanning a couple of different um, industries with uh, my answer here, uh, Moneyball and progress and journalism. Um, but to end with journalism, I think it's really important in journalism um, to keep asking yourself as a writer, am I interested in this idea? Am I interested in this frame because it's familiar or because I really, really think it's true, right? Have I, have I made the mistake of outsourcing my taste or my skepticism to the masses? Um, that's never good when you do that. You, you, wanna, you want to try to keep thinking even when, especially when everyone around you seems to agree about the topic. Yeah, because if everybody agrees, like, that's kind of a red flag, right? Yeah, it yeah. certainly suggests that people have stopped thinking. Um, <laughs> if, it's, if, it's a, if it's an unobvious issue, but everyone around you agrees about the issue, I think it's useful to say, does everyone around me really agree about this complicated issue because we're right and the other side is wrong? Or have teams been created? Yeah. And when teams are created, then ideas are... Um, agreed upon, not, not exclusively because of the quality of the idea, but because of the presence of the team. And so is that an element of tribalism with this teams? Yeah, it is. It's an element of tribalism, but I think it's also, uh, you know, I, it's absolutely tribalism and I don't want to like dismiss the concept of tribalism, but like, it's also like, there's an, there's an element of, especially nowadays for younger journalists, I think this fear of like being called out by people whose opinions you want to harvest um, mm -hmm. and, and, and keep precious. And uh, it's scary, honestly, to be criticized in public in plain view of 1,000, 10,000, 1 million people. Um, and it is safer to say, you know, if I pick a team and I just like agree with the team, then I'm going to be okay. I'm not going to be thinking about that mean tweet that I got while I'm eating dinner or going out to drinks or going out on a date. Um, it's just easier sometimes to go along. Mm -hmm. um, it's harder, I think, to, uh, to have that little, uh, that almost that like little uh, immune system kick in that says, oh, wait, if everyone around me is agreeing, like maybe we need to keep thinking through this issue. Yeah. And with that, do you think that it's, I don't know if it's causing, like, I don't know if it's causal, but do you think that there's a decline in curiosity because people are wanting to stay on a team? Like they're just not willing to do deeper work. So maybe they're not even wondering, right? Like if something's wrong. I think a couple of things are happening. I think one thing that's happening is that um, within certain communities, there is a decline of what you call curiosity. And I mm -hmm. guess I would define curiosity by saying a decline in um, just like the social returns to asking the question, are we wrong? Mm -hmm. um, is there something we haven't found? There also is at the same time, and maybe you've noticed this, um, the rise of this new kind of contrarianism, which I find sort of in a weird way, equally tribal. Like this group of people, and I, I don't, I don't, we don't need to get too specific with names um, because they actually sort of span a couple of different ideologies. But a group of people who see it as their job to point out that essentially the New York Times is wrong about everything, and they yeah. think that they are tribe less, but actually their tribe is the New York Times is wrong about everything. Yeah. Like that, there's a kind of sort of mainstream contrarianism that is its own kind of tribe, and I, I think it's really, really hard when you've fallen into that kind of tribe to notice, to realize that you're in that kind of tribe. So there's, there's no alternative to just like, keep thinking, keep thinking, keep thinking. Yeah. In terms of like, as a solution, just to keep on thinking and keep on questioning. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's the worry is like, it's, it's um, a lot of people want, it, they want sort of simple solutions, right? Like they want an easy answer because the world is so overwhelming. And I think like what you're doing with binaries is, is not an example of that, but like maybe a case of that too, where it's just like, you know, how do you simplify the world? And I feel like a lot of people end up doing that through aligning with an end group, right? I'll say this, you made me think of something that I never really thought about before. I'll sometimes read like a very long, sometimes um, widely praised essay. And I'll be like, I'm not sure what that essay was about. I don't know if that author could have was for, if that author was forced to summarize that essay in one tweetable sentence. I don't know that they could do it. I think it was a lot of just like hand wringing about a subject. On the one hand, on the other hand, the um, 
What's useful about forcing yourself to be simple and clear is that it makes it easy for other people to tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> and that's good because if you're wrong, you want to know if you're wrong. Yeah. So if I have a really simple conclusion to a story about the economy or a story about like the origins of the teenage um, anxiety crisis, yeah. um, if I have a really clear thesis, that's useful not only because the thesis is transparent to me, I know what I think, but also because it's transparent to everyone else. They know what I think. And if they disagree and have really good evidence that I'm wrong, they can tell me that I'm wrong. Um, yeah. I think sometimes, you know, it's easy, especially if you're giving yourself like, you know, a long podcast or a long essay mm -hmm. to write around an issue and around it and around it and around it. And people can sort of like praise the volume of words that you've used without ever being able to point out to you that like your conclusion is wrong. And fundamentally, like, what are we in this business to do? It's to like, it's to root out the truth. Mm -hmm. And tr you can arrive at the truth more simply, I think, if you force yourself to come up with simple conclusions that can be disagreed with simply. Yeah. Yeah. And that's hard, right? Like, <laughs> I think it's also hard to simplify stuff too. And so it's, it, as you're saying, like, it's, it's so much easier to write around a topic or to write really um, intricate words. And, and uh, yeah, there's a sense of insulation with that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'm also, you know, you, you've published this on work piece, um, which is an anthology of the different essays that you've written on work. And in a Fast Company article, you said, if there's one thing I could change, I would have been a little bit clearer. Given all the problems that exist in the world, people loving their jobs a little too much is not such a huge problem. So in the present moment, is there something that you wish you could be clearer on or something that you want to explain in more detail that you haven't been able to yet? Within the concept of the future of work? I guess um, just Or the concept of, of workism specifically? I mean, yeah, workism or if like something else that you're thinking of that you haven't been clear on. I'm just curious. I think I'm, I'm constantly going back and looking at things that I've written a year ago, two years ago, and um, uh, curling my toes with embarrassment. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I guess I want to tell myself that that's a good thing because it means that I'm growing. Um, if I weren't growing, then I would look back at the stuff that I did three years ago and be like, wow, that writer's so much better than I am now, right? That would be a sign of decline. Yeah. Um, uh, so maybe regret is a sign of growth, but, uh, on the topic of workism specifically, you know, I wrote this piece that, um, uh, that really got away from me in a good way, you know, mm -hmm. became a part of the lexicon and, and people started using it and, and writing about it. Um, this idea that a lot of, especially higher educated people in today's society, especially sort of secular young people look to work to do the things we've historically sought from organized religion. Um, and uh, the piece itself is very negative about this. Um, and I, to be honest, am very curious about like the downsides of the decline of organized religion. I'm curious yeah. about this from the perspective of being um, a secular reformed Jew. Um, so uh, it's sort of a physician heal thyself situation. But um, I, so I'm interested in the downsides of the decline of organized religion. But I do think that I was too hard on workism to a certain extent. Um, uh, I was too catastrophic about it. Um, I think that the truth is um, lots of people who go through difficult periods in their life um, and love their job find extraordinary peace in having a routine that they can return to. Um, I've had tragedy in my life where uh, the presence of a job I loved was an extraordinary self, and I know other people who benefited from that as well. And so I do think that, like, on a serious note, like, um, there's nothing wrong with loving your job. There's nothing wrong with being lucky enough to fall into a life of work that's meaningful to you, especially if you can balance it with other things that lead to a well-adapted and meaningful life. Um, so I think I probably didn't emphasize that enough in the, in the piece about workism. I was more focused on the ways in which this kind of overinvestment in our work identity could lead to misery. Um, and the truth is nothing is simple. Both things are true. <laughs> Um, a, a finding a wonderful job um, and a wonderful career is fantastic, but it can be too fantastic. It can cause you to overinvest in your career at the expense of other things that are such wonderful parts of life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's very lucky to find jobs that you love, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a balancing act. And uh, 
you know, this is revealing of me going through like tweets again, but uh, you tweeted, uh, you know, I've been juggling more life flash professional projects uh, more than normal. And I've felt a slight but noticeable erosion in my medium term memory and capacity <laughs> to carry tasks to completion. And I know you just had a baby girl. So congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, but I'm wondering uh, if you managed to find a solution to this erosion of capacity. Um I, I think erosion, I mean, certainly w w given my, uh, my level of um, sleep quality right now, which is not high, <laughs> I would say that um, uh, living with uh, constricted short to medium term memory capacity might just be like a chronic issue for me. Um, <laughs> but I, I will say that you know, we're just talking about meaning. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's certainly nothing that I found that's like, that, that, that's as deep as, as having a kid. Um, like I really do feel like, um, there's, there's a way in which like becoming a dad, um, put me like very in touch with like the evolutionary fact of my existence. I felt like, I feel like I have all these instincts to be a dad that like just arise out of nowhere. And I'm like, I don't even, I didn't even realize that me was a part of me because yeah. it's the me that's like a hundred million years old that has been fathering for millennia before I was even born, just like was passed down to me. And so the instinct can just like burp right up out of me when mm -hmm. my baby does something. And like, there's something beautiful, I think, about, about that. And I will say that one of the benefits of, you know, to make it big and existential or something, um, <laughs> one of the benefits of, of family overwork um, is that uh, you can't be, you're not really fired from being a dad. Um, the negative feedback loops from work are um, really like cut to the quick of esteem. Um, you come out with a podcast and people like it or they hate it. Um, you come out with a tweet and people retweet it or they don't retweet it. Um, it's uh, it, every, every little bit is, is subject to the approval of, of the masses. Um, being a parent is not. There's no masses. It's, everything is one-on-one. -on -one. It's a dyad. Um, and so I do think that it's important for people to uh, maybe... I've never thought of it this way, but to find like a portfolio of feedback in the world, like some feedback that is like one-on-one -on -one and some feedback that is like one-to-many. Yeah, like a feedback index of sorts. A feedback index, yeah. A fidelity <laughs> feedback index. Right. Trades on the stock exchange. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you, Derek. This has been awesome. Uh, where can people find find your work and, and buy your book when it comes out? Uh, I write for The Atlantic. I host the podcast Plain English with the Ringer Podcast Network on which you have appeared. Yes. I uh, tweet and do all that stuff. Um, and the book with Ezra will be released at some point in the future. But um, <laughs> given what you know about the book publishing industry, um, who even knows when that date will come? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. You got it. Thank you.